Zand, I'm about to do a red blood cell experiment and I need a plate of donuts that I left here. Donuts? Well, I don't know anything about a plate of donuts. Really? It was a plate exactly like this one here. It's just it was full of uneaten donuts. And this seems to have little scraps of eaten donuts. Well, I'd love to help, but you probably just forgot where you put it. Maybe. Unless, of course, someone's eaten them. This is not the moment for these baseless accusations. It's time for investigation out. Did you know you have around eight pints of blood in your body? But what if you lost a lot of blood in an accident or your blood had a disease? This is the Bristol Blood Centre, and it's full of blood that has been donated by healthy people to help patients. In this room is almost half of England's blood supply. Wow! The blood here is given to patients through bags like these directly into their veins. It's called a blood transfusion. Now, most of the time, this works very well, but just occasionally, their immune system starts to reject the blood that's been transfused into them. So, the researchers at Bristol have developed an amazing way to make blood that won't be rejected. Part of that team is top scientist Dr Ash Toy. So, Ash, what are you doing here in this lab? We're taking a portion of normal donor blood and we isolate the stem cells in that portion of normal blood and we grow more stem cells from that, which we then turn into red blood cells. This blood grown from stem cells is purer, so it won't get rejected by its recipient. That's amazing! But what are stem cells? Different parts of your body are made up of different types of cells. They're everywhere. In your blood, your brain, and even your hair. Stem cells are your body's spare cells, which don't have a job yet and are waiting to be told what to do. What's brilliant is that scientists like Ash have found a way of doing what your body does naturally in a lab, turning stem cells into red blood cells. In this slightly unremarkable-looking flask, there is almost a miracle of modern science taking place. How do you make sure that these cells become red blood cells? They're in a really rich nutrient solution that helps the cell know that it wants to be a red blood cell. This is a real image of a stem cell, and every stem cell has a nucleus in its center, but red blood cells don't. And there's a reason for that. They have to be tiny enough to squeeze through the smallest blood vessels in your body. So the first thing that has to happen to a stem cell if it's going to turn into a red blood cell is it needs to lose its nucleus. To demonstrate this, I've had to get some more donuts. I've still no idea what happened to the other ones I bought. If you have a cell with a nucleus and you try and squeeze it through the blood vessels, you can see it doesn't really work very well. You can get it in, but it damages the cell pretty badly. If I remove the jam, sorry, nucleus, it'll turn into a red blood cell. So that's ended up as a sort of squashed disc shape. And that's a special shape that the red blood cell has to have to be more flexible. And it is a tight fit, but it'll get through and remain undamaged. So it can squeeze to about half its size because you no longer have that nucleus in the way. So that is why red cells have to lose their nucleus. Let's take a look at this under the microscope. There's an example there where you can see these cells with no uh, dark nucleus. They are basically red blood cells. The hope is that in a couple of years, patients whose bodies reject donor blood will benefit from this pure lab blood made from stem cells. And this is the final product. This is 100 billion red blood cells. It might not look like much, but this is the most that anyone in the world has ever managed to produce from the stem cells of a single donor. Wow! Ouch. Every second of every day, your brain is choosing what to ignore and what to pay attention to. But we all hear, see and feel the world in different ways. There's one condition, though, that really impacts how you communicate with people around you and sense the world. It affects over one in a hundred people, and it's called autism spectrum disorder, or autism for short. This is Alex. He's 10 and he has autism. So, Alex, if you have to explain to people what it's like for you having autism, what, what do you say? It can cause me a lot of difficulties in day-to-day -day life, um, because I absolutely love crowds and busy areas and people brushing past me. Someone with autism is on the autism spectrum. This is like a scale, 
and different people are affected in different ways. We've come to the park and set up an experiment to demonstrate how Alex's autism affects his senses. What I've done is I've labelled the faders, which are like the volume knobs, with different sounds. And these are all the sounds we can hear around us. And when you're talking, I know there's a bit of traffic, there's some birds singing, I can hear the kids playing over there in the playground, there's a dog barking. But mainly, I can hear you, and my brain can just turn all these other sounds off. Can you show me maybe what it's like for you? I don't have as much control over it, so I'll just read them all up there. But then I won't be able to block those out a little bit. But I can't block them out anywhere near as much as you did. Being overloaded with all this sensory information can lead to something called a meltdown. What's it like when you're having a meltdown in your head? Well, I just really kind of um, upset and angry and, I suppose, distressed and then I'd, I'm really not calm. Although autism can be disorientating and confusing, some autistic people are able to concentrate incredibly well on something they love. And for Alex, that's filmmaking. We've come to the Autism Show in Manchester. With us are some of Alex's friends who often act in his films. What do you think it is about autism and directing films that those two things work quite well together? Focusing on one task that he's doing at once. Yeah, he's very focused and a lot of the time has better ideas than us. To help Alex's friends understand what it can be like to have autism, we're giving them these virtual reality goggles and headphones which will play an autism simulation. Why don't you try it? Do you know, I've never tried virtual reality before. I can hear every single noise in this room and the light is very dazzling and I can't focus on the thing I think I need to be paying attention to is this lady who's telling me to wait, but I can't understand what she's saying. Wow. What did you think of it, Jacob? It was really intense of what was going to happen next. It's very overwhelming. Like, you can't concentrate on one thing because there's just so much going on. I thought it explained to me a lot more about how being autistic is and it was kind of stressful. You might know someone with autism, you may have autism yourself, but even if you do, it can be very hard to know what other people with autism are going through. There are a few things you can do to help. You can give people time, you can speak really clearly, and you can remember that someone with autism may be experiencing the world in a more stressful way. Most importantly, autism isn't the main thing about anybody. People on the autism spectrum can still do absolutely amazing things. And I'm certain that one day I'm going to be in the cinema watching a film directed by Alex. Ouch. Wolves can be really annoying sometimes and make you wish you could see over them or through them. Zand, you're not eating my cake, are you? No, no, no cake here, no. Good. Now, your skin can be a little bit like a wall. When you get a medical problem on the outside, it's easy to see it, treat it and watch it heal. But when you get medical mysteries going on inside the body, there's one hospital department you need to turn to for help, the radiology department, because they've got all kinds of cool kit that can actually see inside the body. A bit like this periscope lets me see over the wall. Zand! The new radiology department at Alderhey cost a whopping £7 million. This department x-rays 75,000 patients a year, and more than half of those have their snaps taken on this, a plain film x-ray machine. X-rays let doctors look at your bones. They're like a super powerful version of ordinary light, which can pass through your skin. When they meet bones, x-rays stop dead in their tracks, and the perfect picture can be taken. It's not just bones that show up in an X-ray, though. I'm heading to another part of the radiology department to see a different type of X-ray machine. This one is used to study people who have problems swallowing. Nine-year-old Isabel is currently fed through a tube in her stomach as a result of having an operation. She's come to the radiology department today for a video fluoroscopy test to see if it's now safe for her to eat and drink normally. So I'm wearing this apron and it is very heavy because it's made of lead and that protects me from radiation. Radiation isn't dangerous for the patients, but if you get a little bit every day, that could be dangerous. So you wear a bit of protection. I'd have preferred a green one. We're going to give you some well, yogurt to eat, OK? 
Isabel's dad feeds her some special liquid which x-rays can't pass through, so it shows up black on the image. Can you see it? What's amazing about it is that you're making, if you like, an x-ray movie, so we can see the liquid going down her throat as a video, and that means we can make sure that it's safe for her to keep swallowing and that none of the food is going down the wrong way. So, Isabel's esophagus is working fine. The fluoroscopy has shown the doctors that it's safe for her to start eating again. Isn't that amazing? After a whole year of being fed through a tube. It's busy in the radiology department today. Down the corridor, nine-year-old Neve is having another sort of picture taken called an ultrasound for a mystery swelling in her foot. Here to do that is Dr. Musa Kalim. The way the ultrasound machine is working is it's using a probe which emits a very, very high frequency noise, such a high pitch that you can't hear it. And those sound waves bounce back differently depending on whether they hit bone or whether they hit muscle or different things. And it's listening for the echoes coming back and then putting those echoes into an image. This area which looks darker than the normal tissues around the bone. So bone is here. So there's something, possibly a splinter, irritating Neve's foot that will require further investigation. Have you given it a name? Jeff. That's a great name. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Jeff. Bye, son. Without the amazing radiology department at Alderhey Hospital, the doctors and other experts would have to spend a lot more time guessing about diagnosing people's conditions. But these machines are so powerful, they can see deep inside your body. They could even see a piece of cake inside your stomach. Don't tell Dr Chris! Dan! What? What are you doing? I'm sleeping! Or at least I was. But why? Well, everyone knows sleep is an important way for the body to heal itself, to restore, to recover. From Son, the... I know what sleep is important for, but why are you doing it now? It's the middle of the day. We have important medical technologies and, and, and innovations and, um, and stuff to investigate. Do we? Yes, it's time for Investigation Ouch. Do you remember this guy, Casper? He came into the emergency department after tripping over a tree stump a year ago. Casper had an operation to fix a hole in his bone. Now, your bones are a totally unique material. There's nothing else quite like them, and so you need really special stuff to fix them. And today, we're going to find out how that special stuff is made. Come on, you lot. This is Imperial College in London, and scientists here are working on incredible new medical treatments. Professor Julian Jones is working on new ways to fix our bones. And it all starts with this, a piece of glass. I would have thought that glass would be the very worst thing in the world to repair bones with. It's brittle, it chips, it's sharp, it's not very strong. So either you're crazy or you can explain how it works. Yes, that is glass, but it also is a special glass called bioglass, and it has special powers. If a surgeon takes that and puts it into the body, it will form a very tight bond to bone. And it also tells the cells in the bone to get active and produce more. So the glass actually talks to your bones, your broken bones, and says, needs mending over here. Absolutely. Wow. Bone can heal itself really well, but sometimes with a big hole, it needs some help. Bioglass can do this by bridging the gap and giving the body's own cells something to hang on to and make new bone. Bioglass is made from the same raw materials as window glass, except it's got lots more calcium, which is good for bones. Well, I think we need to see some glass get made, don't you? To make bioglass, the raw materials are measured and weighed and then mixed together before being superheated in a special furnace to 1,400 degrees centigrade. This turns the solid sand into a molten hot liquid. Oh, wow. That is very, very hot. That is amazing. So in here now, this pile of sort of white rubble, that's bioglass. Yep, it's been quickly frozen into place by the water. This is brand new bioglass. It's then dried, sterilized, and ground down into a very fine powder, ready to be used as bone fixing material. So what the surgeon would do is take some blood from the wound and then just apply it, a little bit of it, to the glass and then sort of make a putty all those proteins and cells in the blood will, will clump the grains of glass together, so it ends up like, like putty, like chewing gum almost. Yeah, and then the surgeon will just press it into the hole in the bone, and then over a few weeks, months, 
the bone will repair. So if your research goes according to plan, in my lifetime, I will see dramatic changes in the way we can treat people's bones. Absolutely. Professor Julian is also working on a type of bioglass that can be printed. Its specially designed shape means bones could heal even better. And he's developed a bouncing bioglass. This is glass, but it doesn't break, it bounces. Yep, unbreakable glass. Amazing. This could replace cartilage, the stuff between your joints. Bioglass is amazing stuff, and it's in hospitals right now, helping patients like Casper who need their bones fixed. And the best news is, scientists are working on even more applications for this amazing stuff. Thanks, Glass.